Hello and welcome to part 3. Now, this one is all about analysis and I must say I think it's the hardest bit in the whole of C7. So, um, and it's parts where most people requested me to talk about. So, um, there is going to be a lot of me talking in this one, but just deal with it, you know what I'm saying? Okay, chromatography. There's one question here which I completely do not know the answer to, so I'd be really helpful if someone could answer it for me, actually. But anyway... Chromatography. This is paper chromatography. And the question is, what is paper chromatography used for? To identify individual chemicals in a substance. What this will, how this works is basically some paper is dipped in a solvent, so either ethanol or water, or maybe something else, I don't know, whatever takes your fancy. And that solvent will gradually go up the paper. Oh god, there's a fly in my ear. Anyway, never mind. Now... The substance being tested is put on the paper. As the water moves up the paper, that substance spreads out into individual chemicals. Chemical and those in turn will start to move further up the paper with the solvent. Now, there are two phases, the mobile phase and the stationary phase. The mobile phase, like mobile home or caravan, is something that's moving with my keys with my phone anyway never mind and the stationary phase is something which is stationary right so it'll be the paper so the individual chemicals move up with the mobile phase but they'll continue um changing between the mobile and stationary phase in fact they're said to reach an equilibrium there but that doesn't mean the set the amount entering the stationary phase is the same as entering the mobile phase. They're just continuously alternating between the two. So substances which go higher up the paper have obviously spent more time in the mobile phase, haven't they? Because they've been travelling more. And ones that have been spent less time in the mobile phase and more time in the stationary phase will be further down the paper. Now the RF value is used to calculate and measure what the individual chemicals are. This is the formula for it. Distance travelled by the substance that's being tested, so, or the chemical, divided by the distance travelled by the solvent. So a line is marked on the top of the paper. When the solvent, of, when the solvent reaches that line, you take the paper out. And then you look at the individual spots of the chemicals left behind on the paper. On here, I like to use my ruler here. We're looking for spot X. That has travelled 1.5. The whole thing up to that line is 4.2. So 1.5 divided by 4.2 is 0 0.36. Question 4. Which colour is in the sample? Haven't got a clue. Explain why spot Y is at the top of the paper. That's basically what I've just explained. It's spent more time in the mobile phase than the stationary phase. They are more soluble in the solvent. Okay. Here. Now, there are now there's this table here. Right? This isn't actually in the revision guide. So have a look for it, pause it and remember some stuff. Pause it? Great. Moving on. Right. Now Okay, before, there are two other types of chromatography. Thin layer chromatography, which is very similar to paper chromatography. Only the stationary phase is a long, thin layer of silica gel. But the rest is more or less the same. A silica gel is spread on a surface. Um, it's the same, but then there's also gas chromatography, which is a bit more technical. Basically... Well, first you have to get it into a gas, so you need to vaporise it. The mobile phase is a viscous, that means sticky, liquid, um, such as oil. Well, vis viscous actually means thick, actually. Why did I say sticky? Anyway, and the um, mobile phase is an unreactive gas, such as nitrogen. So the gas into the test is inserted into a tube coated with the stationary phase and also containing the mobile phase in it. The individual chemicals spread themselves out between the mobile phase and stationary phase 
So that means individual chemicals leave the tube at different times. If they spend more time in the mobile phase, they'll leave the tube quicker. Right, this is basically some general stuff about analysing chemicals. When sampling, the sample must, must represent the bulk of the material being tested. Is that your writing, Alex, by the way? Just write off. Anyway, this is easy when the sample is a liquid or a gas, as the sample can be easily mixed before sampling. However, with a solid like soil, to ensure the, the sample represents the bulk material, several samples would need to be taken from different areas of the field. Is that what that, that says? Okay, well... To ensure reliability, multiple samples will be needed, especially if you are testing a random sample of chemicals all from one batch. Sample storage and transport needs to be taken into consideration. Samples need to be sealed to avoid tampering and safety issues need to be considered when transporting chemicals. Okay, making a standard solution. I think of this basically as just doing a recipe. If you're good at following and memorising recipes, this should be played fairly. Okay, D. So put these in order. The first one is accurately weigh one gram of sodium hydroxide because that's the mass, that's the solid you're going to dissolve in your solution. Okay? You have to weigh it out how much you want. So we, in this case, we want one gram. Second, dissolve the sodium hydroxide in a small volume of distilled water in a beaker. So it's slightly dissolving it. We're not getting it up to the full volume we want, but we need to dissolve it first. E. Transfer the solution to a 250 cm cube graduated flask. Here we're transferring it. So obviously, to get it correct up to the right volume, we need to add some more distilled water. So A. Oh, no. Before that, we need to rinse all the solution from the beaker using more distilled water. Because obviously, when you tip the beaker into the graduated flask, you're still going to have some liquid there. So you're going to rinse that out, the beaker and the thing you've been mixing it with with some distilled water and pour that into the flask as well because otherwise you lose some um, sodium hydroxide F is what I was trying to say add more distilled water up to the volume mark on the graduated flask so the meniscus the bottom of the meniscus which is basically the surface of the water notice how it always sort of curves has to, the bottom of the meniscus, meniscus has to be in line with um, the line on the flask. Because otherwise, if it goes over, you'll have to start all over again because it wouldn't be accurate. So it's always best to use a pipette when you're doing that. Place a stop on the graduated flask and shake it. Okay, and then you can check the meniscus again and add a bit more if you need to. Now this is the hard stuff. Titration calculations. Woo, people have been loving these. Okay, let's go through this one. A titration is basically when you have an acid with some indicator in, you put alkali in a burette, gradually add the alkali to the acid, and measure how much alkali is needed to neutralise the acid. Or it could be vice versa, how much alkali is needed to neutralise, no, how much acid is need needed to neutralise the alkali. Right. Ethanoic acid and sodium hydroxide react according to this equation, right? Be careful. Always be on the lookout for big numbers before the main chemical. Because that may trip you up trip you up because then you'll have to double or quadruple or whatever your relative formula mass. Twenty five centimeter cubes of vinegar was used for each titration. The average volume of 4 grams per decimeter cube of sodium hydroxide used was 12.5 centimeters. Calculate the concentration of ethanoic acid in the vinegar. Now that seems like an awful lot, I know. So, first, what am I looking for? The concentration of ethanoic acid. Now we don't know the mass of ethanoic acid, so first we need to find that out. So to find that out, I think first we need to find out the mass of our other reactants, and that is sodium hydroxide. If you remember the formula concentration equals mass divided by volume, you can rearrange the equation 
So you call mass equals volume times concentration. Now, they'll always give you the volume in centimeters cubed, so you always need to divide it by a thousand. So, 12.5 divided by a thousand is 0 0.012, no, 0, oh God, whatever that is, times four, because that's your concentration. That gives a result of 0.05. I've obviously made a mistake here. I've done a lot of crossing out. 0.05. So that's the mass of sodium hydroxide. To find out what mass of um, ethanoic acid reacts with that, we have to do this equation. We have to times the answer you have by the relative formula mass of the thing you're looking for divided by the other one so that's all about ratios what it, that's basically saying is how many um, sodium hydroxides can fit into um, ethanoic acid just learn it really I don't properly understand that um, times 60 divided by 40 and that equals 0 0.075 so that's the mass of ethanoic acid now we want we don't want that we want the concentration so basically we just use the formula again concentration equals mass divided by volume so 0 0.075 divided by and i'll give you the concentrate the volume in the question 25 centimeters cubed right there right divide that by a thousand first though so it's 0 0.075 divided by 0 0.025 that is a three three that's the answer three grams per decimeter cubed Hope that was sort of helpful. Thank you very much.